who are the ideal patients who you would consider for kidney sparing? Look, the most ideal setting um, really is if you look at the European guidelines that have, they define low risk, you know, they're very binary in their classification, right? It's low and high risk. And if you look at that low risk, for me, that's like a very low risk. It's like a single tumor, less than two centimeters or 1.5 centimeters, right? No indication that there's any high grade. And of course, for any urologist seeing a patient like that, you know, that's, that's a great case. You know, you, you do your ureteroscopy, you probably get the whole thing with one biopsy or basket and laser it. And, um, and so that's very gratifying. And I think with the AUA guidelines, we tried to define that too in the favorable low risk category. And so that really is the most ideal patient for kidney preservation in an uh, elective setting. Unfortunately, what none of those guidelines predict is the risk for recurrence, which right. is, you know, the, the Achilles heel of kidney preservation, because there are some of these cases that you treat once and they never recur. And then there's cases that you treat once you thought you did great. And next thing you know, they've seeded everywhere. Right. And we can't really predict that very well. Um, and so that that's the difficulty with kidney preservation. But at least we have some sense of who a good initial patient might be for that. Um, you know, what gets to be less clear is when you get in the imperative setting where they have a single kidney or chronic kidney disease, or there's some hint that it's high grade. And, and then, you know, then we start having some uh, difficulty knowing, you know, if this is really what we should be doing or not. Right. It's so challenging. And I think that, you know, I think a lot of what we're doing is try to parse out who those patients are. Um, you know, prior, we'll talk a little bit about the Olympus trial, uh, which is a very important trial, but prior to that, what was the standard for these patients who, let's say underwent either, you know, a complete, uh, endo endoscopic resection or, you know, a minimal, uh, ureteral resection? What, what, what did we do otherwise? Well, I mean, the truth is there was really no standard. You know, that we, we talked about those days was um, the gold standard being that for ureterectomy and everything else was the Wild West. You know, right. I mean, of course, you know, we gave lots of people gave topical therapy. We gave topical therapy, many different ways of giving topical therapy. Um, you know, what we a lot of us who did this frequently realized you need to reliably deliver the medicine. So you can't just put a stent in and hope that there's reflux from the bladder, for example, like that's not reliable. The only reliable ways is to put a tube in there, either by antegrade or retrograde, and know right. that you're getting in. And since it's not a reservoir organ, the only way to make up for the absence of, of a reservoir is to drip it in really slowly, right? I mean, that's it's just a poor man's um, you know approach to all of this. And so that was our standard. And of course, we use different medications. Um, the best data that used to exist was from Switzerland and Urs Studer's group where they used BCG. And I remember early in my practice looking at that data and kind of thinking through what was there, because what they showed is that patients who had CIS did really well, reasonably well with BCG installation. But when they used BCG as an adjuvant for preventing recurrence of papillary disease, that data wasn't as good. And so it got me thinking, well, why is that? You know, does that have to do something with the immune system? Of course, this was before we even have, you know, checkpoint inhibitors and talked about the tumor immune microenvironment. I mean, there was some thought about that, but I, my very, you know, uh, poor, again, poor man's way of thinking, I thought, well, you know what, with this data, I think I'm justified using chemo. So at that time, we used mitomycin quite a bit, hated it, quite honestly, because really to, it's such a finicky drug. Um, for you to really optimize its conditions. The patient has to be dehydrated. You have to alkalinize them. Um, and, you know, it's really tough to get patients to do all of those things, but we did. And so we did topical therapy for a while. And so, um, you know, the advent of the, the mitomycin hydrogel, uh, you know, I think really helped at least, you know, establish the first standard, if you will, um, regardless of what you believe, you know, if you believe the data or you don't believe it or not a fan of it because of its potential side effects, the fact is it was a study that was established based on years of conversations with 
dozens of urologists in the field right. and years of conversation with the FDA. So, you know, in some ways it does represent, you know, you can just look at it and say, oh, well, it's FDA approved and it's a paper that's out there. But in truth, really, it's a culmination of years of conversation, you know, and, and in, in many ways represents a consensus of dozens of experts in the field who are involved. Mm -hmm.